I know. Thank you for inviting me. This moment is always precious for me because I have known and adored Nelly for a long time. And every time I meet a new class of University of the Underground students, I'm, I'm always delighted because um, as Nelly is that we can go around the world with these uh, with these connections but at the same time every time I meet the class of the University of the Underground I go around the world myself and I really love not only the, the geographic diversity but also the diversity of cultural background and that's why I did not send you any readings beforehand I wanted to have a conversation with you today and I also wanted to ask you if there's anything in particular that you want to know and then I will target and I will tailor that. I'm taking notes myself and I will tailor those readings. What I would like to tell you about today is about, um, well, moments of crisis in cultural institutions um, and also rejections that you might get not only because of force majeure but sometimes rejections that come from uh, committees and what you can do to kind of this idea of curation also elsewhere. So let me start, first of all, with curation, this idea of curating. Many years ago, well, not so many years ago, about six or seven years ago, everybody was talking about curating, pretty much like right now, there's this idea of DJing or tailoring or um, influencing. Curator was a word that was bandied around a lot a few years ago. And I found it really interesting because some of my colleagues would get incensed when they would hear that people that were, say, curating the olive oil aisle in the supermarket were considered curators. And instead, I've always loved it because in truth, a curator can just arrange different knowledge for people in different ways. And it doesn't all have to be art or design. And uh, there's no school of curation that I consider really valuable. It's more uh, what you study and then the way you like to deliver it to people. But just to give you an example, uh, years ago I studied this department of R&D for the museum, which I will talk about later and you might want to go and look at. It's MoMA research and development and you'll find um, more about all this. In, what we do is we organize salons that are uh, meant to discuss topics that are really important for people to prove to people that museums are not just places where you go and look at art on walls but rather places where you can go to really think about life. So we do salons about death, we do salons about aging, salons about protest, um, salons about angels, we even did that. But the very first one that we ever did was about curation. And for every salon, uh, we bring together different speakers, usually four speakers or six, four to six, and uh, discuss this topic from various angles. So the very first one, I think was, oh my God, long time ago, it must have been 2012 perhaps, but um, it was about curation. <laughs> Sorry, my director husband is telling me, breathe, okay, thank you. I have, I, truly, I have a husband who's a director, he said all the lights. <laughs> I'm performing for you. Okay, okay, got it. So um, the, the first four were <laughs> that, well, I was moderating and then there was the chief curator of painting and sculpture at MoMA, Anne Temkin, who of course is what you think of when you think of a curator. Then there was Jeff Jarvis, who is a journalist and a professor of journalism at CUNY, the university in New York. And at that time, it was the time of the Arab Spring, and he advanced the idea that uh, a journalist does not only write, but sometimes also curates sources. So he was presenting to the public the, uh, the uh, reliable sources about the Arab Spring. Then there was Maria Popova, you might know her. She has um, started brain pickings, and at that time, she was calling herself a curator of online interestingness. Now she changed her her, uh, her description, but curating what is available in history of literature and online illustration and bringing them together. 
And then last but not least was Tor Hermansen, who is a music producer and uh, a music author that writes, he's the part of the duo Stargate, that is a duo that writes songs for Beyonce, for Rihanna. So like really pop major songs that was talking about how music producers sometimes used to go online these websites where young musicians would upload their beats and sometimes they would curate these beats with attribution. So four very different ways of thinking about curation and we had this great discussion and we got to the conclusion that curators have of all kinds, olive oil, music, journalism, have two things in common. One, they are trusted guides. So they earn the trust of the public, of their public, which is different publics, right? By proving themselves. So you don't improvise, you start and then you gain trust and then people trust you and you become this guide. And second, which I find really interesting, is that curators truly are performers of sort. They need an audience. Without an audience, curators maybe are artists or just they are like singing in, in a forest of, of silence of sorts. They need to have their audience. So that's said you can be a curator in many different ways and you can also apply this idea of curation to many different realms pretty much like the idea of art or design right so you can curate on different platforms you can curate of course in the old-fashioned gallery space three-dimensional space you can curate online using the platforms at your disposal you can curate on video you can curate with public programs I really love public programs they give me a chance to really express the idea that I want to express and that's really the point curators try to express an organized idea of something they have learned. Um, and um, there was a curator here at MoMA a few years ago that gave an oral history and talked about different types of curators. He said there's the curator, the old-fashioned term that takes care of objects, and then there are the curators that instead render the thoughts of one artist in depth. And then there's the hunter-gatherer, and I consider myself a hunter-gatherer, right? I go and look at gazelles and then I just like, you know, bring them all bloody and, and warm to you all to eat. I mean, some of you might be vegetarian or vegan, so I'm sorry about the, the terribly bloody picture, but that's really the idea of the hunter-gatherer. I would like to do something. There's already um, messages in the chat. I, I want you exactly to be absolutely free to ask questions as we go, because since we're going to touch on different projects, oh, these were for Ketty, hello. Um, but it, you, you should be free, you should feel free to also ask questions if you have them. So that said, curation can happen on many different platforms, thankfully, because there are different moments in your career where you might find yourself, first of all, needing to curate and also not have the dimensional space of the gallery. Galleries um, usually cost more to curate in than, say, online. And that's why at different moments in my 26-year career at MoMA, I found myself using online curating or public programs as uh, an outlet for my ideas. And um, one, of these, one of the examples for this is um, a, a project that happened a few years ago about design and violence that is quite relevant today. So there's a question here from Kitty. So curator is not like a manager. Well, more it's like a production, a producer, a curator can be an impresario or it can be an entrepreneur um, or can be a producer. Um, definitely you need to also manage, but what I usually use as a metaphor, Kitty, is, um, the, is a movie director. I use it as a metaphor also because it makes me feel more important, but if you think about it, a movie director is in charge of the vision um, and works with the producer and works with the studios. And uh, I, at MoMA, very often I find myself having to be both the movie director and the producer with MoMA as the studio. And then, of course, you bring together everybody you need. You bring together the director of photography, you bring together the editor, the production designer, uh, you fight with the studios for money. I mean, it really is, it, 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 it's like that. So I think it's more than a manager, but it's also a manager. 
curator. So to be a good curator, you need to know about budgets. You need to think, uh, you need to be knowledgeable of materials and you need to sometimes, I'm an architect by training, so it helps me from some viewpoints, but it took me a while to understand that I couldn't be a capricious diva, that I was in charge of a budget and therefore I had to make sure I stayed within that budget. So I don't think it's very different from what you do, um, but luckily curators have managers that help them stay on the, on the narrow, on the straight and narrow. So, in the case of design, how far curating is defining design, or maybe how far curating is pushing the boundaries of it? This is a question from Dorian. Very good question. It really depends on the curator. Um, there are curators that um, like to um, they like to show what has already happened, and then there are curators that push. Now, the history of MoMA with design is very interesting. Um, it's, uh, it's, it was born, MoMA was born in 1929, and it was a very Eurocentric institution based on the idea of the Bauhaus. So ever since the very beginning, the founding director, Alfred Barr, who was in his late 20s, was hired by the three women um, that founded the museum to bring over this idea of the unity of all the arts. And since the beginning, architecture and design were part of the conversation. But then the curators that succeeded, or, you know, Philip Johnson lasted for the whole history of the museum pretty much, but um, the, men, the curators very often use design as a way to push and promote middle classes especially, so a new way of living, especially after World War II and before. This, uh, you know, after World War II, the, uh, the um, soldiers coming back from the war in kind of an even way, but they got given some money, the GI Bill, to restart their life, maybe go back to school, start families. And design was a way in which, uh, the, uh, in which MoMA could buttress this explosion of the middle class. But anyway, uh, and it's on that we have many curators that appreciate. For me, there was Cara McCarthy that did a wonderful show of design independent living. There was people designed for people that are differently able. So these ideas go back for a long time. I introduced video games in the collection, information design, icons, and many others. So we keep on pushing the definition of design as much as possible. That's why I resist the definition of design, if I can, because it's as vague and as, uh, and as comprehensive as art. So if you try to define it, it always sounds like a platitude, right? So um, definitely it's important to, to think about it in expanded terms. There is also a question from Pierre that asks how I went from architecture to curating and I'm picking this question up because it makes sense in the conversation that we're having. I studied architecture in Italy and in Italy you tend to, um, to study a subject and then decide what to do with that subject. So um, Architecture is an example, but it could be also sports or medicine. So you study something and then you decide whether you want to be a professor, a practitioner, a journalist, a filmmaker. And in the case, in, so that makes usually for not so good pros, you know, you have to kind of train yourself in the means of expression, but usually the content is very, very solid. Um, and so when I studied architecture in Milan, I had um, a choice of what to do. It was a very messy university at that time. It was public school, I think $200 a year. I mean, but it, it was a gigantic mess. And um, I worked as an architect for six months. I realized that I really was not good at it. And even before, even before um, um, graduating, I was um, working at Domus part-time, which is a magazine of architecture and design. I was freelance curating as you know as a gopher I started out working for free I mean the, the usual things but it happened quite organically so um, I'm gonna go back um, yeah so I there's a Amir is quite interesting I'll get to Amir later so it design and violence was a project that initially was an exhibition so uh, I, it all happened uh, and 
you'll find the whole project still online, even though it doesn't receive comments anymore. Um, what happened is that the 3D printed gun was announced several years ago, you might remember, Cody Wilson, you know, a libertarian philosopher, he calls himself, and uh, he decided to release online, open source, the digital files to print a gun, a lethal gun that you can kill people with at home. And I remember how stunned I was because I always thought that 3D printing, I was always enamored of technology, especially additive manufacturing at that time. I thought it promised so much for the future, a future in which uh, there would be no more waste and everybody would be fab labbing around the world and printing out whatever they need. So just bring people. I didn't think about it before. And um, the big epiphany for me, because until that moment, I always thought that design was a force for good. I used to say that designers almost take a Hippocratic oath. And instead, I realized that no, just like everything else in human nature, things can go either way, you know, for good and for bad. So I asked a very good friend and great partner in crime, Jamer, Jamer Hunt, uh, to work on it with me. And we started collecting a series of objects that have an ambiguous relationship with violence. And, and we presented a proposal for an exhibition about them. Uh, and if you see online, the ambiguous relationship with violence ranges from posters against female genital mutilation that are at the same time really violent and also beautiful and poetic. Then it's the Kalashnikov, which is a lethal um, a rifle, not only because it kills, but also because it's so easy to manufacture and to fix everywhere. And at the same time is a great feat of design. So you'll see, or the, 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 the redesign of the slaughterhouse by Temple Granding. So, Ambiguity was always important, but when we presented it to our committee for as an exhibition, um, my colleagues, I'm part of that committee, my colleagues said, um, no, not as an exhibition. And I can kind of understand why now in hindsight, right? Because it's still an art museum and uh, uh, these objects from an aesthetic and traditional um, viewpoint, formal viewpoint, were really not what you would expect there. That forced us to find something else. You know, very often you get rejections and um, I've had so many in my career. So sometimes you just get rid of the project altogether, okay. Uh, amen. Other times you shelve it and you wait and we'll, I'll tell you about broken nature later on. Other times it feels urgent, so you find a way. And what Jamer and I did uh, is what you do when you don't have money and don't want to ask for money or permission. We started a WordPress site and we called in favors. So every week we would post one object. There would be a curatorial introduction. Then there would be an essay by somebody authoritative. And at the end, the beautiful thing that we could not have done in the gallery is to ask a question and people then would comment. And it was quite great. Um, if you look at it online, we had, uh, at the beginning, we started with uh, Jamer's research fund from Parsons and, and his assistants. Then finally, MoMA saw that it was a, an interesting project, put it on the website, and then I could work with the curatorial assistants at MoMA. First, it was Kate Carmody, then it was Michelle Millar Fisher. So it became a really beautiful project. It became a book, a MoMA book. And in the end, it became an exhibition, but not at MoMA, but rather at the Science Gallery in Dublin, because the people from the Science Gallery that are friends called me up and said, we would like to take the exhibition. And I told them, there's no exhibition. Why don't you do it? Since you're Irish and <clears throat> Irish people know about violence, you can do something meaningful. And it was just a beautiful that the sense of urgency became really grassroots, calling in favors and uh, creating this sort of like momentum, um, making a book and then the exhibition was released in the open space and in the open source. So sometimes, even though once again it's a platitude, when you get given lemons, you make a really good lemonade. <laughs> Um, yeah, the, the connect the environmental crisis. 
Yes, when talking about Paola Antonelli, I have heard from different people who have worked with you that this is done because Paola wanted it to be done this way. I'm really eager to hear from you yourself that what is this is Amir. This, is, this goes back to the director part, right? As a director, you take responsibility for the vision. If things go wrong, it's your fault. The buck stops with you. And if things go right, you know, you need to take, take leadership. So I think it's like that pretty much for every curator. Um, it's funny. I guess, I guess it can be pretty bossy, but I, I, yeah, I guess so. <laughs> I think it's part of the job, right? Um, to deliver a strong idea and failure so far, fingers crossed. How do you think curating will change the connection to the environmental crisis we get there? So I'll talk about that. But so design and violence, you can take a look at, and broken nature, you can take a look at. at. And these are two examples, I'm sorry, not broken nature, research and development. These are two examples of curatorial projects that are not in a physical space and I think that uh, oh thank you very much for posting it um, and I think it's really no, I can post it too you're so right um, and uh, um, and this is really an example of what you can do when you are First time be in a physical space. Now, the beautiful thing about design and violence was not on the fact that we could make it happen even after a rejection, but also the questions at the end of a post. So, if you go, for instance, to the post about the um, redesign of the slaughterhouse, which I will direct for you, it was quite amazing written by Ingrid New, who's the and, and you know, I might know the design of the slaughterhouse by Temple Grandin was made so that cows would not be scared knowing that they are going to be killed. That she introduced this curvature that made sure that there was a separation. It's one of the most perverse things that you could think of. Um, and Ingrid Newkirk said, well, you know what? It would be better not to touch any animals, but if we have to kill them, at least let's kill them in the right way, which is really a very um, amoral or morally ambiguous uh, predicament. And at the end, there was the question, which is, can you design a violent act to be more humane? And we got about 150 comments, um, while instead for the final post, which was about the lethal injection, therefore killing humans, we got very few. So it's interesting at all scales how a project like this can give you a glimpse of, um, our, of how violence has changed in our society recently, and also how our attitude towards violence is biased by, mm, who knows what, but is biased. You know how there are those tests for um, the kind of inborn or innate or unconscious racism or unconscious um, prejudice this, I think we have the same when it comes to violence. We consider certain acts to be more violent than others. What we also did, um, stemming from this exhibition, is we did um, a beautiful series of Oxford-style debates in real life. That's another example of a tool that curators don't think of using, but is so amazingly effective, which is to have live debates with people and emotion and a public and the first one we brought in Cody Wilson the guy that released the 3d printed gun who argued against a great friend of mine Rob Walker a great journalist and it was great because Rob Walker seemed looked like the crypto anarchist himself right so even in this case the motion needs to be designed in the right way so that there's an ambiguity that you can fight about so the motion was not about the right to carry guns which would be what you would think of in america but rather it was about open source should we support open source no matter the consequences right so even in this case, you can see, you can, if you ever want, you can look at the posts. The last one was about Larry Lessig, was with Larry Lessig and Biela Coleman on how to keep the internet free. So altogether, really interesting, um, interesting topics. 
let's see, Dorian again, how could you define failure in curating if we think curating as a practice that allows people to build a critical point of view on specific subject on their own? Well, you still have a public, you have a responsibility. You need to, um, you know, I work at MoMA, so uh, MoMA is my studios, so I need to either make them money, which I usually don't, <laughs> because, you know, usually my exhibitions are not necessarily the ones that drive crowds to MoMA. But the good thing is that I, um, I deliver in other ways. So I'm the curator of contemporary design. So I think that MoMA relies on me to uh, cover the contemporary part of that tradition that has existed since the beginning. So I have, I, I have the ownership of that responsibility for MoMA. If you work for a gallery like Agosian, your responsibility is to make money. So even when you do shows that seem to be non-commercial, you're still driving money there. And sometimes you have also a certain amount of money that you need to drive in every year. If you are the curator of a small independent <clears throat> gallery in Bushwick, your mandate or your responsibilities towards the artists that you represent. So you're never ever working in a vacuum. It needs to, um, it needs to deliver. So measure metrics of success as always in our work, whenever it deals with culture, the metrics of success are the most complicated to figure out but you can you think of the direct responsibility that you have towards the institution, the public, the artists, or, um, or even the, the public institution, right? So, <clears throat> Nela asks me, Nela, I suppose, how do you feel about boycotting galleries like the Zabludovich collection that are connected to violence to their funding? Hi, it's a very big deal. And um, I completely support that um, I completely support public protest. I think it's very important. Um, I think it becomes really subtle when you realize the fact that there's often no other form of financial support for many galleries, but still it's something that needs to be done. And I am very happy to see what happened when it comes to the, the opioid crisis and the Sackler, part of the Sackler family, because I didn't know, for instance, I was surprised that the Serpentine still had Sackler galleries, but I realized that even in the Sackler family, there are parts of it that are completely disjointed. But, you know, um, I think it's important that we call people uh, on, uh, on their backgrounds. So, but at the same time, I also know that it's incredibly complicated. I think that we need to tackle that issue and we also need to tackle the whole issue of the funding of culture. Um, and we need to tackle the metrics of culture. You know, so one of the salons was called Culture and Metrics because it was exactly about that. I would like to have a way, like a good economist that gives us silly, no, it's not silly, but understandable metrics that we can feed to politicians for them to prove that the cultural sector is as important, if not more important than the financial sector. And the R&D the R &D department was born out of the 2008 crisis because I went to the director of MoMA and I said, now it's our time to prove that culture delivers and instead the financial sector <clears throat> betrayed us. So. It's a big system and that's what I think is important. It's for us to think of the, um, of the um, illegal, or, illegal or, or how did you call it, Niela? Uh, connected to violence or funding that is, not, that is amoral or connected to immoral situations with the fact that governments are abdicating responsibility. So I think that there's a very direct connection as often happens. And um, that's why not, uh, just to tell you, I think that my, ro my, mm, my role as a curator, and I'm connecting it for, I'll explain why, my role as a curator is not to tell people what's beautiful or what's cool. My role as a curator is to stimulate people's own critical sense and to engage them in reality. And I believe that one of the most important aspects of reality that I try, that we should try to convey through our work are peer systems. The um, make people understand that things never happened in a 
bionivocal way, but rather that there are reverberations. Like about a few days ago was the, um, the anniversary of the tragedy in Rana Plaza in Bangladesh, where a building fell and killed more than 1,100 sweatshop workers. And all of a sudden, the, um, the plight of laborers that are exploited all over the world and uh, the criminality of fast fashion and of the whole system was in front of everybody's eyes as if it didn't happen normally but that was a way for people to see and some people all of a sudden stopped buying um, clothes made in Bangladesh. Now that's the wrong reaction because that makes the situation even worse. You have to treat that in a systemic way and you have to understand that the system starts with certain uh, distributors so they can augment the hourly salary. But this is just an example. So once again, I think that artists have to do the right thing and they have to boycott and stand by their beliefs. And then that should sensitize people that can act on systems like politicians, for instance, but of course they don't do anything to actually change the system as opposed to just letting this kind of uh, important reaction go unheeded. So, um, cultural metrics, thank you for sending it, that's great. Um, so, let's see, Louise, what are the biggest challenges for an art institution to move online in terms of curation? That's very funny, so we can argue, that's very funny because I mean, it's not you, a fun. Well, yeah? You started this before everybody else with design and oh, art. That's, that, so oh, that's what I was saying. It's in bringing things online. <laughs> well, uh, it's funny because my first show at MoMA was in 1995. It was called Mutant Materials in Contemporary Design. And I wanted a website, <laughs> but MoMA didn't know what a website was, right? So once again, I started arguing, this is what a website is. It's important because we, we will keep an online record. And they said, you know, whatever, Paolo, okay, here's $300, just do it, you know. I think it's enough, right? And um, so I used the money to um, to do to pay dinners and drinks and late night taxes to a student, a graduate student at the School of Visual Arts who taught me HTML, and I coded it by myself. And that was the beginning of the MoMA website, right? So, um, and it's funny because if you go to MoMA.org and you and you put mutant materials in there, it's still there, right? And the checklist is still there. And that's exactly what I wanted. Let me send it to you. Um, I wanted that. I wanted people to be able to, um, to find the checklist even years later. Now, from that, it be that was still called like an experimental project, which is kind of funny uh, because they didn't pilot project. They didn't really know what to do or um, with it. But uh, afterwards, other curators did it. Oh, you've already done it. So I'm not going to do it anymore. You do it. So um, it's really, it really is about um, getting it started, right? The problem happened when we started doing fancy websites, like for instance, I did a show called Design and the Elastic Mind, and the website for that is fantastic. It's so beautiful. It was done by the master of Japanese design, and uh, the problem is that it's in Flash, right? So you can still access it if you download Flash, but there's been this moment of Flash websites that especially that really weighs on my stomach and instead the design and the, uh, the um, Newton materials website it's ugly, ugly I did it myself with HTML everybody can find it so that's it art and systemic change what are the mechanisms for stimulating critical sense through via art okay Let's talk for a moment, where must the bodies of the audience be placed vis-a-vis -vis the reality in which they are to be engaged? Well, it depends. Like my colleagues at MoMA PS1 have done a series of really strong exhibitions that did not shy away from violence. There was an exhibition about war before lockdown. They did exhibitions about real, like, direct violence. And I believe these exhibitions are very important. They're not the exhibitions that you can do at MoMA, um, except in certain, uh, in certain areas, because you need to know who your audience is. In other cases, for instance, when it comes to design, I can talk now about the 22nd Triennale di Milano, and that can also um, link to another questions that somebody asked about environmental, um, about 
I don't remember who it was, sorry if I don't mention your name, but you asked about uh, curating and design and the environmental crisis. So last year, I curated with a great team um, the 22nd Triennale di Milano, which was called Broken Nature. Uh, the, the Triennale di Milano has existed for almost 100 years. It's about how architecture and design can be relevant in the contemporary world. Uh, Broken Nature was about how we severed some of our ties with nature and we are part of nature. So how we have created the situation that is really unbalanced and, and, and entropic and, and a recipe for disaster. And it was advancing the idea that we will become extinct, but we can design an elegant extinction so we leave a good legacy as a human species and it, it talked about restorative design it talked about the different strategies that not only designers but citizens can use to have a more restorative attitude towards the world um, how did it confront people by showing them great examples at different scales the exhibition started very cosmic showing how the world has changed because of our interventions then it got very very pragmatic and prosaic uh, with exhibition for instance there was the flushable biodegradable pregnancy kit right or uh, the ruby cup the menstruation cup or there were examples of how to use water in a very rational way in Mexico City so it went from the cosmic to the absolutely pragmatic then it went into the systemic because I was trying to show how systems are part of reality so it talked about circularity it talked about electronic waste and then it went from that to empathy, which is really the way in which ultimately we can apply all these different um, systems, right? So empathy is respect, right? And respect is what will push us to use circularity, to recycle, to reuse, to implement all the different strategies. So that's what you do. You confront your audience, and that was an exhibition for citizens who decided I say citizens because I banned, I banned it, uh, I banned from my lexicon the idea of consumers, you know, I don't, our users, not citizens. We confronted them with great examples, with uh, um, reasons to really think deep, with examples from communities of people that um, are still in, in, in real connection with their traditions, with uh, the example of great designers that have been thinking of using design and as an investigative tool. I don't know how many of you know Forma Fantasma, but you would really enjoy their Instagram and especially their Instagram Live. They just did an exhibition at the Serpentine in London about the industry of lumber and everything that is behind it, the underbelly of it. So you just present people with great examples. You trust that they'll understand. If you're a good curator and you hire good designers and you write your texts well and you think about your public, it's going to work. You know once again it's it's like a movie um i like movies that are not completely cryptic i like movies that engage people and still are masterpieces that's my ambition so i try to get to that okay pierre you know for my fantasma I'm, I'm great many of you know them so they were part of broken nature with their um aura streams with their electronic waste project and now they've done this about wood and they're a little bit like forensic architecture right you know forensic architecture i'm sure you're also quite familiar with them <clears throat> and forensic oceanography was also part of Broken Nature. So truly, um, there are many different ways to, um, to engage the public. So the Triennale, by the way, is the building where I started my whole career as a little golfer, like I was running around and trying to help install this exhibition. And it was wonderful to be back there. And with my... <clears throat> curatorial team that's Ala Tanir who's now working on the Venice Biennale um, and uh, Erika Petrillo also working on the Venice Biennale and the Van Eyck Institute and then Laura Mairan who's on staff at the Triennale we had these three goals we wanted <clears throat> every it was for citizens and every citizen should come and live with a sense of long time right the long time that is beyond 
within the two or three generations that we can normally think of, so a sense of long time, then they should, have, they should be able to come to the exhibition and leave with a sense of systems, like very important, we live in systems. And third, they should leave having a sense of what they could do in their life every day to be more restorative. So leaving with something in their mind. There was um, this, this piece called Capsula Mundi. You might know about it. It's uh, for green burial. So it's like this big egg and the body is stored in it, the corpse. And then there's a tree, very, very almost like childlike, but beautiful. And I remember this 75 year old Milanese lady with the perfect suit, the perfect purse, etc., running to me saying, you need to tell me she was all quaffed. You need to tell me I need to talk to my family because, you know, I wanted to be very normal with really okay, I want to be buried, I want to tell them, how do I get in touch with the designers? And also another beautiful thing is that the kids that were organizing the Fridays for the Future, you know, with the Greta movement, would gather at the Triennale to start their protest. So that's when you know that you're successful, right? In that case. Let's see, Niela again and Zach, how do you see curators who don't work in galleries or museums have to think differently about curation than someone who does work in galleries and museums? It's the same answer as before. You work, I mean, I always work as an architect or designer, right? So I always think, what's the goal, right? If it's a museum, I have a certain kind of goal. If it's a, a gallery, I have another kind of goal. If you're in neither situation, you just really think as a designer of the goal in front of you and you pursue it with whatever tools you have at your disposal. You have the goal and then you have the means and the means are the money that you have or that you don't have and whatever is accessible to you, whether it's like Instagram or Zoom or whether it is uh, a, a camera, you know, just whatever you have at your disposal. And then the other, <clears throat> the other question is what makes an exhibition or program accessible? It depends on what kind of accessibility you want. Uh, of course, um, as far as I'm concerned, I talk about physical accessibility all the time. It's always been important and it is important for mom. So I usually keep the tables at certain levels so they can be viewed. There's always a program for people that cannot see. Um, so they can come when the museum is closed and they can touch selective pieces. There's always, so we all have that kind of accessibility. Then it really depends on the exhibition and the museum. In the case of my exhibitions, I know without being corny that kids are the toughest critics kids aged 5 to 15 say they really are brutal and I very often uh, keep them in mind when I organize a show I want them to be able to see everything because then I know that I will get an honest feedback um, let's see we have uh, actually going a question up in from New York me. I can see Michaela and Jan here maybe yes Michaela okay here. so let's see Maybe Going up in New York in the Michaela? 90s. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Mickey, do you, you want to pop on your screen? Yeah, pop there you are. Pop. Um, <laughs> so I grew up in New York in the 90s and I was spending most of my weekends at the MoMA, if not school trips. Um, and I was always really dumbfounded by how the MoMA hosts to watch community visitors every single day, but at the same time represents and even challenges the New York community and as well as American identity. And I would be really happy to hear about how your own experiences with creating design inform your perspective on how institutions can kind of wear multiple hats at the same time or use multiple narratives to unify without overtaking. Um, mm. Yeah, thank you for the question. It's complicated. And, and uh, this is the question that you asked is something that my colleagues and I think about all the time, the Department of Education and the Department of Outreach. I mean, all the time. Um, we look at our statistics, we understand how many people are coming and going. The New York uh, audience is extremely important to us because that's where we belong, right? So, so we think about it all the time. I think that the diversity of the exhibitions is very important, even though we don't go crazy, but doing it but we try every time to have an exhibition of modern art that speaks to a wide audience an exhibition that is more like a discovery of something that people did not know about i think that of this is part 
of my life. Then there's the public programs that happen all the time. So we have the luck of having, and I'm saying it with all my heart because I miss them right now. I have great colleagues that really are super smart in the way they approach things. Of course, sometimes I get really frustrated, you know, it, it happens, you know, I always, we always have to uh, gripe and whine about our own, um, our own ideas, don't get, but I have to say there's really great leadership and great committees and, and we think a lot about all this. Mm -hmm. We'll see what, for instance, right now we're, gonna, we're thinking of how to reopen and it's a big question mark and I am part of the crisis management team which almost every day online and which has also engaged an immunologist so you know it's we always think about it. it's behind the scenes who wants to ask me a direct question next yeah you decide who yeah where are you yet hi ho. yeah hi. Uh, you show me a great background but not today <laughs> yes <laughs> oh, oh 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 <laughs> don't worry uh yeah i i just thinking about it. Uh, here in Brazil, uh, we had a lot of boycotts or so big exhibitions with the subject about uh, sexual diversity, about gender, and this kind of thing. And I think on the responsibility, responsibility uh, of uh, be a curator of a big museum as MoMA, and yeah, my question uh, is is about uh, much about this. How can you manage uh, exhibits that have this political agenda in a museum like MoMA? Uh, yeah, because here uh, we have a lot of these uh, movements from the conserva from conservative uh, from the conservative movements and stuff. Yeah. yeah, it's difficult, and I know. Well, first of all, many of your institutions are public. So the government has a direct influence on what you do, which in this moment in Brazil is really difficult. Brazil has a history of finding ways to protest. Um, I'm thinking of Elio Itisica, I'm thinking of all those great moments in which artists and museums staged uh, protests that were subtle. It's a little bit like what happens in China sometimes. MoMA is private, number one. We don't, get, we don't get any money from the government, zero. So we can't have that pressure. We have a board of trustees. Some of them are conservative, but there's such a um, tradition of supporting the arts and supporting ideas, even those that you might not believe in, that there is still support. So for instance, when um, our president, uh, a few years ago decided from one day to the other to ban the entry from five or seven, I can't remember anymore, Muslim countries into the United States. In the span of 24 hours, my colleagues had deinstalled the galleries and installed only art coming from those countries, right? Instantly. So um, it doesn't matter whether there are Republicans or conservatives on the board they will still support and not interfere. So I think the freedom of, of, uh, of speech and freedom of expression is something that despite what the government is trying to uh, make happen still exists in the United States. And that's what enables us to be political, even overtly political, right? Um, I feel that um, your country and many other countries are going through a very, very difficult moment in which autocracy is taking advantage of the current crisis to reestablish itself and to, well, let's see, we've seen what's happened in Hungary. Um, in, in a way, it's a very difficult moment because many uh, freedoms are being eroded without us noticing because we're so focused on the coronavirus. Hey, thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You pick. Not I, I was just going to say because we I have see that we have ten minutes left, and you know they're they're currently they are working on a project which is about dance. You can hear me, which is about dance as a discipline that can be. No, I didn't hear. I didn't hear. I didn't. I didn't hear who the people that you mentioned was. You broke up at that time. Who? who uh, you sorry. About? 
I was, uh, sorry, my internet came in and out always. You can hear me now? Yeah. So I was saying, um, you know, they are all working on a project which involves dance as a discipline that can build new politics in institutions. And they started from the Georgian context. So in Sibili, you know, how dance was used to kind of like build the whole uh, revolution there and so forth. Um, do you, and of course you were doing this uh, exhibition, you know, with Neri Oxman on the uh, silkworms. I mean, is that, is choreography and the way that, ah. you, a way and a means that you think about building exhibitions or how does that build into your practice? Because they have to make an exhibition themselves as well, just saying. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> they have to of finalize course. their of project course. as an exhibition. Uh, definitely. Oh no, that's beautiful. Well, definitely, um, dance is a big, big reference and metaphor for many curators. Also, we have a very solid department of performance and media here at MoMA uh, with Stuart Comer as a chief curator. By the way, um, I did not tell you, but MoMA just added an expansion, so the a new part of the building that is only for exhibitions, and in it, Stuart and his team built a black box that is only for performance and dance, but we also have a lot of dance in the main atrium. So it's part of what we do. I think that choreography is definitely a, a great way to think of an exhibition. It's like narrative or melody, you know, it's, you can think of how people move in the space. You can think of how the objects and the exhibition move, even without moving, but how they surround you and how they express themselves physically. So it's definitely super important. Um, and uh, Nelly is, is talking about the exhibition that is currently open. It stayed open for two weeks before the, lo before the lockdown, which is an exhibition of the work of Neri Oxman. Neri Oxman is an Israeli-American architect um, and um, scientist that has for a really long time pursued the closeness with nature, in involving nature in making by using additive manufacturing and computational design. So using the most advanced technologies to be able to seamlessly involve nature and sometimes also letting go of some of our control. And the main piece of the exhibition is the Silk Pavilion too. For those of you who already know Neri, and I see that some of you do, she did a silk pavilion originally that was like a Bucky Fuller dome, geodesic dome. And this second one instead gives silkworms themselves much more agency. So the one before was a little controlled, the geometry was very controlled. And in this case, instead, the silkworms that are the active contractors and construction workers become also a bit the architects because the second pavilion is made with this water soluble fabric and silkworms before they start spinning their silk thread they poop and pee with abandon so they eat mulberry leaves for a, a week they do nothing but eat an enormous amount of mulberry leaves you cannot imagine they shed skin a few times and then when they're ready to spin you can see them you put them on this fabric and they go <laughs> and they and they make holes in the fabric because of their poo and pee and then they uh they get to fill those holes with their thread so it's quite beautiful there's really an interaction and initially we wanted to have the silkworms do make the pavilion in the museum um, which would have been a disaster because right now we would have live, live silkworms to take care of in, uh, in the closed museum. So thank God we, we couldn't do it. And we couldn't do it because there were not enough viable silkworms in the United States. Since there is no real industry here for silk, there's no mulberry plantations, there's no, only very small, and we needed 17,000. So we did it in Padua in Italy, and then we brought them here. But we are using, if you think of the dance, the dance happens with videos. So the exhibition is all an exhibition. It's, there are other six projects beside the Silk Pavilion. And the exhibition is an exhibition of demo pieces. So this beautiful Silk Pavilion is a demonstration of a technique that then is shown with great videos. So in my, uh, in my job, video has become 
incredibly important. And Nelly knows it very well because Nelly, I mean, she's an artist, she studied design, she was, she's very hybrid, but she always understood the importance of video. And that's what many designers today do. Neri, definitely, Dan and Raby, Forma Fantasma. I mean, being really proficient and conversant in video and other expressive techniques is very important today. That's why in this day and age, you can't really tell an artist from a designer by the means of expression. If it's a video or painting, you can't. It's more of a declaration of intent. And I know that I'm touching on a question that everybody, probably you don't need an answer to that. What's the difference between art and design? And I'm gonna answer like, oh, I don't know. <laughs> but really it's, um, it's more in, in the declaration of intent. And to keep them motivated as well, I mean, what are the chances that their exhibition in whatever shape it takes might make it to MoMA? What, what will it take? You know, it would take, uh, as usual, it takes <laughs> talent and quality, you know, talent and quality of your exhibition, so passes master. And then it takes, it's a, it's, it's a jungle out there. As you and I know very well, ideas are, ideas by themselves in the head are very easy to have. Um, making them happen is really, really tough, you know, so you need to pick and choose the ones that you want to throw your time and your uh, efforts, sometimes also your money, but not necessarily unless you think that time is money behind. And then you need to promote them and find somebody that will also decide that amongst all the different ideas, that is the one worth battling for. So I think we're all you and then me as a second uh, filter to your um, dissemination. You could bypass me, by the way, by going directly to your audience. But as the second filter, we're all fighting for attention, for money, for time. And uh, I think that more and more quality is what is necessary to really come um, to really surface, right? So in a, in, a, in a moment in which so many people can, can, can show their work and so many people can attract attention, I think that the drunkenness of possibilities will be followed by a variety that is going to resurface quality, aesthetic quality, expressive quality, narrative quality, um, meaning quality also, how much an object really can be meaningful in many different ways to its audience will become really paramount. So that's what I think everybody should work on. <laughs>